Victor, thank you very much. It's bittersweet to be part of this class. It, it was easier to present this the last time I presented because I was, I rode up on my motorcycle from Tijuana and just came to the class and taught and then went back home. And I love Tijuana. I loved living there. Um, I ended up moving back to Pennsylvania because I started a job working remotely, um, had been newly married and my parents were needing some assistance at home. So I told my wife, I'm like, Hey, you know, what do you think we go back to Pennsylvania? I haven't lived back home in 18 years. Um, been away for 18 years and, uh, we decided together, yeah, let's go and do it. My wife, like, uh, Victor mentioned, uh, my wife Yasmin is from Guadalajara and so she's never lived on the East coast. She only got to experience, uh, the East coast for a brief visit. Um, before that, um, curious how many of you guys have been to, uh, the East coast, um, even like New York. I don't know if you can like raise a zoom hand or, uh, anything on our feature here. If you've ever been to New York, um, yeah, anyone from San Diego, Southern California, that area, like, go to New York City. Maybe not now during COVID. Well, definitely not now during COVID. Post-COVID, go to New York for sure, because it's just such a cool place. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're back here in Pennsylvania right now, but um, I definitely miss Tijuana. Like, San Diego is awesome. Um, obviously, it shares the same climate as Tijuana, but the culture, uh, the life... Being there in Tijuana was just so awesome. Uh, I spent four years living there and I absolutely loved it. So uh, I had been attending San Diego State. I was actually in social work. Uh, I was in the master's program for social work. Uh, I only ended uh, in the program for a year. Um, a big reason was because I was just so enamored with living in Tijuana that all I wanted to do was focus all of my time in working to learn Spanish and getting involved with the immigrants who were there, working as a, 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 a legal translator there and working with Americans who wanted to learn Spanish and learn the culture. So I ended up leaving the grad school social work program at San Diego State to focus full time on that. But um, I reached out to uh, Victor uh, because I actually wanted to attend the class. Like you guys are, I wanted to attend the class and I didn't get into the class. I only got to go in on the first class and observe it. I wasn't accepted into it. I got into the, the overflow list, but I later contacted Victor and I said, hey, like I'm living here. I'm a white guy you should have me here because I also work with Americans who want to come and I can share. And he said, yes. And so I would be presenting here in the class. So, um, at this point, I guess I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll share my screen and, uh, I have a little PowerPoint here that I can share. Um, yeah, you, you Victor, feel free. You can, uh, uh, share the permission here. I'll, uh, share my screen. Is that um, uh, I, I'm sorry, what's that? Over your right shoulder, there's a horrible picture on a billboard. Oh, golly. Yeah, Is so, that yours? So here we go. So so here we go. Pop quiz. Yes. So uh, if I recall right here, I'm like squinting because my uh, my thumbnail is so small here. Food yeah, food has, has no, no walls. walls. Um, for those who have visited Tijuana, does anyone know where this is in Tijuana? I'm trying to figure it out. I'm not. I can't figure it out. Yeah, isn't it? Um, I forget the the name of it, but I know where it is. It's like a, it's like it, it has a bunch of different like food. Yes. Uh, yeah, but I, I forget the name. I don't know why I'm forgetting on it because I've been various times. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's called Telefonica. Yeah, there we yeah. go. La Telefonica. Yeah, it's yeah. called Telefonica, and if I recall it right, it's called Telefonica because it's uh, it was basically in the area where the original um like the, the, the original, um, TV broadcasting area was, um, in Tijuana. So no. well, yeah, when you go to Tijuana, you go visit Telefonica. It's like a block away from, uh, Torre Agua, uh, Agua Calientes, which 
is a reproduction that was made in the late 80s, early 90s of the original air traffic control tower of the Casino Agua Calientes, which in the 1920s, Tijuana was the most visited city globally. Tijuana was filthy rich in the 1920s. I actually have a video on YouTube where, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Teresa Libre. Derek Chin runs Teresa Libre. It's like any gringo who wants to go or any any person who wants to go and visit Tijuana, um, go do a tour with Teresa Libre, which means free tourist. Um, Derek and I, we did a presentation two years ago at Startup San Diego um, about how basically Americans, Americans basically started Tijuana. Like Tijuana was basically this outpost along the border so far thrown from the central part of Mexico that once it was in 1885, um, Victor, this is, I guess, extra. This wasn't part of the original presentation, but I'll share a little bit of this. So in 1885, the, Transcon the Transcontinental Railroad in the U.S. landed in San Diego for the first time. So all these Americans from the East Coast can, in a few days, get to Southern California, get to San Diego. And when they got there, they realized, no way. Mexico is like 10 miles south of here. And in Mexico, we can do all sorts of things that we can't do here in the US. So things like gambling, um, the sale of alcoholic beverages, horse racing, uh, things like that were permitted in Mexico that weren't permitted in the United States. So there are all these American businesses that popped up south of the border and that brought all these Americans to visit Tijuana. And it was, I think in 19, it's been a while since I done the presentation. It was at the turn of the century that the first Hippodromo, the first horse race track was in Tijuana. Tijuana had a population of about 500 people, but at the opening of the first horse race track in Tijuana, which was just like 200 feet south of the border, 10,000 people showed up, including the governor, Governor Cantu of Baja, of uh, Baja, California, which at that point was just a territory of Mexico. All these people went, even the governor, in which point the federal government of Mexico did not permit this horse race track, but it still happened. And since then there was just so much American business, so much American tourism, that through the 20s, everyone was visiting, including Hollywood superstars like Clark Gable, Charlie Chaplin, um, all these people were going. And that was great until it was 1933, I think it was, that they, it was, um, they reversed prohibition. So no longer were Americans going to Mexico to enjoy alcohol. They could just do that in the US. And then two years later, it was President Lazaro Cárdenas who reversed and said, gambling is no longer legal in Tijuana. So by 1935, the economy of Tijuana tanked, no one was going to visit, and Americans can now do those things in the US. And that's what basically started Las Vegas. So just wow. a little extra for your money. Um, I love Mexico, I love Tijuana. Um, right here, does anyone know where this photo would be taken, this sign here in Tijuana? Um, feel free to chime in. I know there's a whole lot of people here. I, I won't notice the Zoom hands if they're popped up, but if anyone wants to call it out, does anyone know where this is in Tijuana? Looks like uh, next to the wall. It is. It's right next to the wall. I think I heard someone say, yes, it's in Playas. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's in Playas de Tijuana. So you're looking right there. Um, at the uh, the wall of Tijuana. So yeah, Tijuana was just such an awesome experience. Um, when I when I think of a single word that describes it, it's this. Um, <laughs> anyone know what uh, what this means in Spanish? Whoa. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. More importantly, it's the Northern Baja Tijuana word for cool. If you go to like Mexicali, Mexicali, it's uh, it's um, what is it? Uh, 
Curales Tijuana, Chido. Chido, I think, is, is Guadalajara. Um, there's another word in Mexicali. I knew this the last time I did the presentation. Um, Curido, Curado. It's, it's a little bit different, but anyway, it's a, it's a different, uh, it's a different dialect. One, one of my coolest experiences in Tijuana was, um, in Zona Rio, I lived in a place with like 10 other Mexican dudes. I was the only gringo there. And even those guys all from Mexico, they were all from different parts of Mexico. Cause in Tijuana, Tijuana, you have folks from all over the world, including all over Latin America, including all over Mexico. Because there's many folks from Mexico who go to Tijuana because of the business opportunities. Because you have more international movement, you have more tourism. Um, folks who want to just go and visit for leisure, but you also have medical tourism. So you have people from all over La República de México who live in Tijuana, which was the case where I lived at one point in Zona Rio. And there'd be nights I'd be sitting in the kitchen and I'm still working on learning my Spanish and I'm listening to them and I can tell my Mexican roommates, they'd be confused at one another because some of them would say a different word that another guy wouldn't know. And so I felt kind of cool, like, well, I'm not the only one who's working to learn Spanish here, but, but curada is definitely the word that I would use to describe what my experience was living in Tijuana, living in Mexico in general, but I, I'm a gringo from Pennsylvania. Um, I didn't know a single Latino until I left my hometown to go off to college when I was 18. So I was pretty sheltered, knew, knew nothing about the Latin American world. Um, but my first introduction to the Latin American world was during my undergrad here at Westchester University, which is um, just outside of Philadelphia. So I'm about two hours north of Philadelphia. I'm here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, for anyone who's ever seen the TV show, The Office. Um, I'm Jim from Scranton, that's me, and, uh, and, and this was my introduction to the, the Latin world. I you know, met people who worked at the university who were from Mexico, and um, during that time, I had the opportunity to go visit Ecuador. My sister was a foreign exchange student at that time. She spent her uh, senior year of high school as a foreign exchange student in Ecuador. So a couple friends and I, we went to go visit her at her all-girls high school, and um, I was a sophomore in college. So I was only two years older than the oldest girls at my sister's all girl high school in Ecuador. And the day that we visited, um, it was a part of Ecuador where there's just frankly no other gringos who would go and visit. So the fact that me and my two gringo friends went to go visit and my gringo sisters there, it was kind of anomaly. So they had like this uh, assembly it, it almost felt like it was something out of Latin television where um, they were dancing and, and they invited us onto the, um, the dance floor. And I didn't have much confidence in my dance skills, but uh, I had my skateboard with me. And I grabbed my skateboard and I started skating around and I did a kickflip. And all of a sudden, 500 girls in the audience just <laughs> screamed, and that was the moment that I realized, whoa, I want to learn Spanish. It was as simple as that. We spent a week in Ecuador and I loved it. And uh, I just thought it was the coolest thing. And so after college, since I grew up skateboarding, I knew I always wanted to live in Southern California. I decided to buy a one-way flight and I moved to San Diego. I moved to PB. And um, within a month, I had um, been part of this church that was doing these house build projects in Tijuana. So I got to go to Tijuana. I was part of this group, Mexico Caravan Ministries. We'd go down for a Saturday and we would build um, a home like this. And it was just so crazy to me in that I could leave my apartment in PB in under an hour be on the outskirts of Tijuana build this home and come back. And it was just such a surreal, cool experience to me um, that I knew I wanted to go back. And then some other people at that church, they were part of this orphanage building project in uh, in downtown Tijuana, like a block away from the arch uh, called Niños de la Promesa. So I'd always go back for that. 
um, just more and more going back to Tijuana, it was such a convenient thing and I knew other people who were going, so it, it got kind of easy. And um, San Diego introduced me to the cycling community, which introduced mm -hmm. me to this cycling community in Tijuana, where we would meet on a monthly basis at the archway with all these other Mexicans and we would ride around the city. And I, the, to me, that was the coolest thing. I was like, this is just so, so awesome. Like my, my friends who, like Victor just mentioned, 50% of San Diegans have never visited Tijuana. So I'd go to work on Monday, coworkers would ask me how my weekend was. And I'd be like, oh, I rode my bike all, all around Tijuana. They're like, what? <laughs> like, oh yeah, I wasn't the only one. There was a whole bunch of other people there. So, um, you know, if this is something that goes on and if you're a cyclist, Paseo de Todos, um, anyone want to care to translate that? Take a stab at how you would translate Paseo de Todos? Like everyone's trip? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. They, they would say it, the ride for everyone. So Paseo de Todos, if it's still on Facebook, if you can, if you can Google it, if they're still doing it considering COVID, the ride for everyone so it's a leisurely ride people would just go and people just like booze during it and just you know do that have fun but still fun respectful um kind of like critical mass but but they're in tijuana um so i was falling in love with tijuana just as a tourist i'd come back i'd do things <laughs> like this that's not actually me that's just an image from google but you know I, i'd go and do something like that um, anyone who's visited uh, Revolution, have you seen the 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 zonkeys? Not lately. Not lately. Yeah, I don't know if they're still going on there, but uh, I, I I researched a little bit on the history of this. Um, if anyone's ever curious, so that's uh, the, the history I understand of this. Um, when tourists were visiting Tijuana in the 20s and even beforehand, that they'd go and they'd get this black and white photo. And apparently it was just they, they'd hang out with locals who happened to have had donkeys and the donkeys actually wouldn't show up well in the black and white photos so the story i understand is that the owners would paint these stripes on their donkeys so that they'd be more noticeable in the photos and then it just became this thing folks would go down and you know a local they'd grab maybe a sombrero that they'd have and it would just become this thing so that's from what I understand how the zonkey started, Victor can maybe tell you otherwise, but uh, that's what I understand how the zonkey started. A time or two I've maybe done this, but I liked more of the other stuff. I liked more of the culture, the history, all this and that, but my first real immersion experience um, in Mexico, other than being a tourist, because um, I wasn't really learning the language, I was still living in, in San Diego, um, for a lot of folks who go and visit Tijuana, you realize you don't have to learn Spanish because any of the tourist places you go, um, anyone who works at, at any bar or restaurant you go to, uh, a museum, they're going to speak enough English to bring that tourism in that you don't have to learn it. But my first real immersion experience was in Guadalajara. Um, I had a buddy of mine who he went to Guadalajara years ago. And he volunteered at this camp. He got me hooked up with the opportunity. And so I was stoked because by this point, I really wanted to learn Spanish. He learned it fluently. He met his wife there. So I had high hopes. And during my undergrad, I did study two years of Spanish. Um, so when I arrived, I figured I totally got this because, you know, in undergrad, I studied Spanish for two years and I listened to the recordings and they were like, donde esta el baño? And I learned what that meant. So I figured out, I got this. No way. I did it. I got there. No one talked like anyone did on any of the tapes I listened to. There's all this slang. They talked way too fast, in my opinion. They talked no faster than the equivalent of how I'm talking now, which most of you I'm sure all understand. I just felt like I was a goner. I was like, what am I doing here? This is ridiculous, but everyone was really cool. Um, most Mexicans are like Tijuana, anywhere I visited, um, most locals bend over backwards to just show you that hospitality. And where I lived in Guadalajara was no different. I had opportunities to just be involved and 
and hang out. People were patient with me, um, especially when they looked at me. They they looked at me and figured I wouldn't understand a word of, of Spanish, so that kind of worked to my benefit. No one looked at me and was like, you should know more. I, I wasn't a pocho, basically. For, maybe some of you will laugh when I say that, but it's basically that, just frankly, that that equivalent of if, if you... If you're like a Chicano and you go and visit Mexico, they'll often look at you and think like, well, you should know Spanish because that's your heritage. And and it's sad to say, I, I, I've met many Chicanos in, in San Diego who they grew up just frankly very Americanized, never learned Spanish. And for them, it was it was even harder. So that's just um, that's just part of the cultural reality when you would go there. But, um, you know, it's um, most places I'd go in Tijuana were ultimately really cool. But when I was in Guadalajara, I really wanted to learn the language, so I just immersed myself. I, I, I listened to a lot of podcasts and just tried to read. Just everything I was doing was immersing myself in what the language was about. And uh, by the time I, I felt like I was starting to get it, it, it just it felt like this. It was like, whoa, people kind of understand me. I can kind of carry a conversation. And it was just incredible. And um, I was in, in Guadalajara for six months. By the, the time it was time for me to return to San Diego. And um, by the time I returned to San Diego, when I left, I was living in North Park. And before that, I lived in East Lake. Before that, I lived in, in OB and PB. And so I was like, I ain't going back to any of those areas because um, I will be damned if I lose the Spanish that I worked so hard to, to get. And... Um, yeah, I'm in my 30s. Like I, I, I worked to learn Spanish all in my 30s, so it, it, it wasn't the easiest uh, thing um, to say. So I moved to a part of San Diego where I knew I was going to have to practice my Spanish. Does anyone want to guess what neighborhood I moved to? I wanted to stay close to North Park since I, I'm a big craft beer fan and uh, bike around everywhere. So anyone want to guess what section I moved to? Yes, sir. Say it again. Nestor. Nestor? I don't know where Nestor is. It wasn't Nestor. Chula Vista. Chula Vista is a good guess. Um, no. I beat. City Heights. To, yes. City Heights. <laughs> yep, I moved to City Heights. I was like, I love North Park. I'm too hipster to leave North Park, but I'm now like to want to be Mexican to be... Uh, Totally in like a purely gringo place. So, so I moved to City Heights. Um, I started volunteering with the City Heights Community Development Corporation. And City Heights just has a huge Latino population. It has a huge refugee population. Just, you know, you drive through City Heights and uh, you see billboards in all sorts of languages. So I, I just knew I wanted to live in City Heights. And- Or in Canto, in Cantos. And Canto is a cool spot too. Yeah, I lived on 37th Street in, in City Heights, which was just, it, it was good for me. Um, I was still able to cruise over, go to my favorite craft beer bars, and then ride my bike back. So for me, it worked. And then on all my days off, I would ride my bike downtown, hop aboard the trolley, and just take it south and go to TJ. Cross the border, and I would ride my bike all around Tijuana because by with the bicycle group I got to learn about you know riding my bike around Tijuana although it's much more adventurous if you ride by yourself because it's um, the San Diego culture is used to solo cyclists cruising around and uh, they have something called bicycle lanes pretty much everywhere whereas in Tijuana they don't there's a few places in the the urbans like zona rio that have some bike lanes but in general you got to go in, in a big group um, which is why the the group bike scene of tijuana is actually way better than the group bike scene in in san diego but um i learned like i can go to to Secut on my weekends which is centro cultural de tijuana that's my single favorite place in tijuana the cultural center um it's kind of like a, a few balboa park museums all rolled into one um Riding along uh, the canal in Zona Rio, um, visiting the the gastro um, parks in in San Diego, in, excuse me, in Tijuana, was just so awesome. I had the opportunity to pick up this book, which 
if it's still online if you can buy it, it it's called tijuana 22000 um it's it's awesome isn't it 22000 after its zip code uh this book is so awesome because it's written in both english and spanish and it's translated by both a native english speaker and a native spanish speaker so you actually get pure forms of both english and spanish it's a phenomenal book and Derek Chin from Teresa Libre, he's a contributing photographer in it. So the book is just awesome. And, um, you know, my wife and I, we would visit often. And uh, we're, this was before I, we, we were married, but we'd go to, this was the original Telefonica location. And after about a year of just visiting and meeting other Americans from time to time down there who lived there, who told me it was cool. And then they told me how much they paid in rent. And I was like, <laughs> I'm in dude, I'm moving to Mexico. And so I moved, um, I moved, I got a place in La Libertad, um, single bedroom apartment. And I would cross the border for work in San Diego. And there were actually thousands of Americans who would do the same thing that I would do. They live in Tijuana. And most of us would live in Tijuana just because it was cheap rent. We wouldn't necessarily immerse ourselves in the culture, but we would also enjoy the fact that it's just part of the, the reality that's kind of weird to, 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 to celebrate. But um, on average, most Americans will make four times as much money as, as Mexicans. And so you have this weird dynamic where there's a lot of renters who want to rent to Americans and charge more. And so it's this weird gentrification that takes place, but it, it, it's, it's this reality. And in some communities in Tijuana, it's really obvious. There's a, a big American um, pocket of folks who live there. So like in Playas is huge. There's so many Americans that live in Playas. Um, in La Cacho, there's a lot of Americans who live there. Hipodromo. Um, in La Libertad, there were some, um, just because it's so close to the border, as well as Zona Rio. Um, but I loved living in Tijuana, right here in Secu, right here in Zona Rio, which Zona Rio is, at the time of originally doing this presentation, it had been the fourth largest financial district in all of Mexico. Um, just so much money that comes out of there. Uh, pretty much any major financial institution out of Mexico is represented there in, um, in Zona Rio. And, oh, uh, you know, actually, let me go back here. So here in Sekut, um, have any of you guys ever been to Sekut? Many times. Many times. Cool. Many times. So what have you enjoyed about Sekut? The pool with the Indians spinning around, tied by their ankles. Vol Voladores de Popantla. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Those guys are cool, for sure. Oh, my God. Some well, yep. I'll date myself on Ed Sullivan show and then TJ. <laughs> oh, nice! Hey, they've been you around. I'm Ed sure Sullivan. for the Lord is they've been around for for centuries, maybe centuries. I don't know if they still do that, but it was great. And I used to enjoy the they had uh, the Max films yes. in English, yeah, or the subtitled IMAX. in English, I guess. Yeah, that IMAX is that that big dome right there that the, the, the domo max it's, i love that place yeah yeah and if you go on sundays i mean up until the time that i've been living there on sundays it's free admission and not like it's even you know by american really? standards huge to go yeah so i always tell friends like go on sunday you can always like go in there for for free but otherwise go any other time and it's compared to the admission price of anywhere else you go to in san diego um very affordable and then just beyond that you have um um plaza oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and then there's cali maxis right there yeah and then you have uh, mercado hidalgo which is the the open air um semi indoor semi outdoor market which is just awesome um ceramic oh. tile up and down the rio everything. yeah yeah, there's just so much that's right there. And then you can easily get there if you get to the border and you, you take a taxi uh, right there into where this photo is. It's, it's a two minute taxi or Uber drive right there. So um, just a few cool things here that I that I loved. Um, 
Right here, that upper left-hand corner, that's Pasaje Rodriguez, which is right there on Revolucion, just one of the various Pasajes, which is like the, the alleyway market. Um, I've done a couple tours there. Awesome place to go to. Um, the upper right-hand corner there, that's my first apartment. It was a single bedroom apartment that I rented. I think it was like $220 a month to rent. And it was eight blocks from the border. By the what time I, I lived there, I was able to save up enough money to finally get the motorcycle I always wanted. And um, I worked at a restaurant in University Heights and I'd be able to leave from there and get to work in like 25 minutes. Um, what so year really was incredible. Oh, what's that? What year? Uh, the motorcycle or what year did I live there? The $200 rent. Uh, and this was, I lived in that apartment four years ago. Wow, 200 You can't get a parking spot for that in PB. That's why there's so many Americans. I actually got featured on, I don't know if you guys ever heard of um, Soledad O'Brien. If you YouTube it, um, mm -hmm. I, was, I was one person featured on a news report by Soledad O'Brien. Um, wow. I was talking about Americans living in Tijuana because of the cheap rent. And I mean, I advocated <laughs> for the cultural experience of it because to me, that was the most enriching. It was nice having extra money left over in my account every month. But but even still, it was that experience of great neighbors, great cultural experience, learning the language, learning the culture, just having this really cool experience. The bottom right hand photo. Um, anyone want to take a stab at translating? What that one says? A sad beer. beer. Wait, say that again? With beer. Guess, a sad beer? You got the word sad right. You got the word beer right. So, con, con la cerveza no hay tristeza. So, yeah, with beer, there's no sadness. And that oh. was in, in Plaza, That's Plaza Fiesta. That's not true. <laughs> I, I kind of agree. Yeah, from most things. If it's not, yeah, I can get an alcohol and put them um, But the, the bottom left-hand corner, one of my most enriching experiences was working as a translator volunteer for El Ejercito de Salvación, um, the, the, the Salvation Army in La Libertad. Because um, Tijuana gets the most deportees of illegal Mexican immigrants into the U.S. And the saddest part of that, thankfully it's not the majority, but I met various deportees who they were basically brought there as little kids and they were brought up in the US in primarily English speaking surroundings, English speaking classes in their schools. Their parents only wanted them to speak English but because they were still technically illegal Mexican immigrants, let's say maybe they had a DUI or something, they would get deported and I would beat them in Mexico and my Spanish was better than theirs. And they actually never stepped foot in Mexico other than the fact that they were born there and brought over when they were three or under. And so they would be on the streets of Tijuana like, I don't have family here. I don't even speak the language and people call me a pocho and like, I don't know what to do. And it's a sad reality. I'm sure that Victor can even elaborate more on this, but um, there's challenges. Tijuana has very unique challenges as a result of its position um, and location so close to the U S and because of the, the, the laws and the policies that we have in the U S regarding immigration, war on drugs, that's a totally different concept. And, a reason that maybe one day I'll run for president to work to change it all. But, but otherwise it's, it's just, it's a sad situation, but at least, um, you know, I can work to be involved in, um, inspiring other volunteers to come down, um, send donations and, and just be part of, um, you know, working to, to help make some lives better. Uh, right there in the left-hand side, say that's the El Museo de las Americas where they talk about the history of the Americas in that area, um, indigenous tribes. Um, and the cool thing about that exhibit is everything is written in both English and Spanish as well. So it's a great opportunity to actively learn Spanish um, at the same time. 
uh, anyone ever been to Tacos Frank in in Zona Rio by the border? Y'all need to go. Um, that's that upper right hand corner. Th those are my favorite tacos in all of Tijuana, and it's typically always packed. Um, and it's right there in, in Zona Rio. It's like a two minute drive from the border. Tacos Frank. That bottom right hand corner photo. That's in Mercado Hidalgo. That's also there in Zona Rio. Um, right there, I'm eating yaca. I don't know if anyone's ever had yaca. Um, it's fruit that tastes like bubble gum and is so incredible. Perhaps my favorite fruit ever. Um, and just some of the other cool stuff I got to do while I was there in Baja. I got to, um, you know, work from time to time as a, as a tour guide. I got to tour some friends right there in the upper left hand corner in Valle de Guadalupe. Um, I worked as their translator and uh, designated driver going around Valle de Guadalupe. Um, upper right hand corner there, a couple of my roommates in Zona Rio showing them a slack line. Uh, I was the only person I ever saw with a slack line in Tijuana. Um, just didn't really happen that much. There's, for one thing, there's just not that many trees you see in Tijuana like you do in San Diego. Much more urban. Um, the bottom right hand corner there, my wife and I um, hiking up Cerro Colorado which is like the Mount, um, gosh, I've been away from San Diego already for so long. I already don't remember the name of, uh, what's the major hike, uh, the, the, the major hike that everyone does when you go out East, not Mount Soledad. Cowles. Uh, Cowles. Yes. Really? Thank you. Thank you. It's basically like Mount Cowles or Cowles Mountain. Oh. It's like Cowles Mountain. Um, a little less developed, but there's still a oh. lot of Tijuana locals who will hike Cerro Colorado. And you can see Cerro Colorado from pretty much anywhere in Tijuana. Um, because on the top, you can see it's white with the letters that says, uh, Jesucristo says Señor. Um, so Jesus is Lord, says it on top there. And that's a cool little hike um, of Tijuana. The bottom left-hand corner, I got the opportunity to do an annual hike called the Baja 100. And it's this three-day hike 100 kilometers, we hiked from the Pacific Coast to the Sea of Cortez. What? That was so cool. That was, yeah, I was like the only gringo that I saw on that trip. But but being in Tijuana, you saw ads for it. I applied. I like hiking. And there were a whole lot of people who went on it. And, uh, you know, it was uh, it was great. It was, it was such a cool trip. So if anyone likes hiking and... You want to go do something really, really cool for three days and unique? Do the the Baja 100. Um, Baja Travesis is the group that I uh, I went with. And, and in this presentation, if you guys have any questions, I'll, I'll share my email at the end of all this. You can feel free to email me and ask me any questions on any of all of this. Um, Feria Tijuana. It's like the San Diego County Fair, but in Tijuana. That was so cool. Um, Cool random experience. Uh, just some uh, people that I met at this church that I was going to called uh, La Roca. Um, upper right hand corner, they did um, uh, Dia de la Independencia. They, they did um, uh, Independence Day celebration there. Pop quiz, who knows when uh, Independence Day is in Mexico? September 16th. Uh, September 16. <laughs> 16. Yes, yes, yes. The the fifteenth, the day before, is like when they do the the major fireworks. Which, it, so here's the thing. So the fifteenth, um, if you just if you at 10 p.m. if you look south on September 15th, you'll see all the fireworks. So <laughs> at midnight is when they do El Grito, the Viva Mexico, which has to do with the Mexican independence, um, with um, um, with Hidalgo. So at midnight in Mexico city is when they celebrate it and they celebrate it at the same time, but respective of the time zones. So Tijuana is two hours behind Mexico city. So it's at 10 PM that they do El Grito. So the idea is physically everyone in Mexico is celebrating at the same time, even though there's the differential for the time zone. So they do that on the 15th and Dude, Mexico loves their fireworks. Like, go to go if you, if you can go to Tijuana on Christmas, that's awesome. If you just want to go and like see fireworks on Christmas, 
go to Tijuana. Um, it's such a cool time. Same thing with on New Year's Eve. Um, awesome fireworks. Uh, the bottom right hand corner is my favorite pizza place in Tijuana. It's in Lacacho and it's called Tony's Pizzeria. And it's this guy, Tony, who's from Manhattan. This gringo from Manhattan, 20 plus years ago, moved to Tijuana. And he moved there because I think his wife, he met his wife. Uh, I forget their story, but he moved to Mexico. Another gringo moving to Mexico and falling in love with it. And he's like, I cook awesome pizza because I'm from Manhattan. And it's so, so good. The pizza's kind of like Sicilian thing. If you've had, if any of you guys have had Sicilian thing on 30th Street in North Park, um, the pizza's pretty much just like that. And it's awesome. Tony's in La Cacha. I, I have a video on YouTube. Um, one of my YouTube channels was uh, Immersion Living Tijuana. I do a video on there. I think my first video that I ever did was a tour of La Cacho, um, And I think I mentioned on there Tony's Pizzeria. Um, upper left hand corner, hanging out with my roommates. Uh, upper right hand corner, uh, I tried doing a, a cleanup project for a bit in Tijuana. Uh, I called it Cleaner Wana. Um, big part of that was kind of naive on my part, thinking, because just frankly, volunteerism is pretty much a, a thing in, in the United States, especially in San Diego. You have uh, organizations like I Love a Clean San Diego, and you can go and do a weekend litter cleanup in a canyon or at a beach or somewhere. And there's all these people who show out and volunteer. And I kind of thought I could do the same thing because Tijuana has much more of a need of that, frankly, in my opinion. But what I learned was there's this larger picture that I didn't understand of government infrastructure or lack thereof. And also just, frankly, a mentality of people where one volunteerism really isn't a thing. And well, because frankly, from the opinions I heard, it was kind of like, you would really only go and do that if you were paid to do that, and the government should do that. And it was part of the reason why people would complain about the government. So it really only lasted a little bit, but you know, I I, I tried because it's I always like seeing a, a clean city. Um, bottom right hand corner, there's a cool cat cafe in downtown Tijuana on Revolucion. Uh, bottom left hand corner right there. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever been to Creative Mornings. In San Diego, Creative Mornings, uh, it's an international organization, and actually one of the largest representations of it is in San Diego, and they have one in Tijuana. And so uh, before moving to Tijuana, I got involved with the one in, uh, in Tijuana. I'd go and visit and just fell in love with it. It was a great way to meet cool people in the city and uh, to be part of cool things that were happening. Um, I know there's a couple social workers that are in this crew, so that upper left-hand photo, if the um, La Conferencia Binacional de Trabajo Social, the binational uh, social work uh, conference, that happened, that was at Secu. I volunteered with that as part of the social work program. Um, upper right-hand corner, riding a bicycle. I once rode my bike from uh, Tijuana to, to Tecate. I only did that once just because it, it ended up being kind of crazy because like I mentioned earlier, motorists are not expecting to see people riding their bikes on the side of the highway. Um, I guess I'll kind of leave it at that. Bottom right hand corner, my roommate Miguel filling up the, the water jugs because that's what you do because you don't drink the, the water that comes out of the, the faucet in the kitchen in Tijuana. You fill up your water jugs. The bottom left hand corner, uh, the gentleman that is there in the bottom left hand corner of that bottom left hand corner photo, his name is Enrique Chu, and he launched a Kickstarter to paint the border mural. He wanted he wanted to paint the border fence to create the 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 Guinness World Record for the longest uh, border mural, um, and he accomplished it. Uh, he, he got all this money from the Kickstarter, got all this publicity, all these volunteers, of which I was one. I, I'd help him out regularly. We'd go to Playas right there, as you can see, and just paint the border wall. So if you, if you cruise the border right now in, in Tijuana and you see that it's all painted, you can thank that guy right there, Enrique Chu. Um, really awesome, dude. If he's still painting it, he's probably posting it on, on social media. 
find a way to meet up with him and go and do that. Really, really cool experience. Um, some more roommate photos there in the upper left-hand corner. Upper right-hand corner there, my wife and I, we were volunteering at um, this hippie enclave in downtown Tijuana. The guy who runs it, uh, I forget his name. No, I remember his name. His name is Chris. Um, he's a gringo from Minnesota who moved to Tijuana. And he started this hippie vegan enclave called uh, Enclave Caracol, which means snail. And it's a block away from the archway in downtown Tijuana. And uh, I think twice a week, they would do these free vegan meals for immigrants or homeless or anyone who was in need of um, food. So we'd go and help chop up veggies and cook and be part of that. Bottom right-hand corner, Tacos Varios. Out of the many, many things I love about Tijuana, Tacos Varios is certainly um, on the one of the top things on that list. The tacos are so good at pretty much anywhere you go. So Tijuana is world renowned for their cuisine. From what I understand, um, Los Angeles has two five-star restaurants. Tijuana has five. Whoa. From what I understand, international food critics, if they visit the Southern California, Northern Baja area, there are some of them who don't even go to Los Angeles and San Diego. They just go right to Tijuana because the, the Tijuana cuisine is so incredible. Um, they specialize in something called Baja Med, which is um, Mediterranean Baja Fusion, which is just so, so good. And then um, bottom left-hand corner, Cholo's Games. Just so good to be able to go and see a Cholo's Game. Um, really, really fun time. And then... Uh, I think this is the last of my like collection of photos here, but um, upper left-hand corner, bringing some friends to Alma Verde, which was one of my favorite restaurants in Tijuana. It was in La Cacho. It was a block away from that pizzeria, Tony's. Upper right-hand photo, I was part of a vegetarian cooking class um, at this Catholic school in Tijuana called La Salle, which is an international school, and they held these free schools it was a Catholic school, and because in Mexico, the Catholic Church is still so big, they received enough donations that they were able to do all these free classes. So I was able to take free classes there, and one of them was this vegetarian class. And uh, not only was I one of the only white guys in there, but I was also one of the only guys in the class. So it made it extra interesting. Um, I was also one of the only people who were under their 40s. Interesting, unique time. Um, some more roommate photos, more photos of time with uh, friends and acquaintances out for tacos. Just such good food. And then um, one of the coolest things about living in Tijuana is that you're so close to San Diego. Um, I'm guessing this mural is still there. Anyone know where this mural is in San Diego? No. Then maybe. What's that? Seaport, maybe? Good guess. Um, if it's still in there, Market. it's in North Park. It's where the Belching Beaver Brewery is on 30th Street in North Park. But, um, yeah. you know, th that that spot I was able to ride my motorcycle to from where I lived in Tijuana in 30 minutes. So um, just a really cool perk of being able to be there. Um, and crossing the border right now, I know with COVID, is obviously very different. Even before COVID, it was very... Uh, um, it depended on the kind of boarding pass that you had, whether you had your general uh, ID, whether you had your Sentry, um, or whether you had a motorcycle. Motorcycle is the, the quickest way shy of teleportation. Um, and, you know, why would I encourage someone to live in Tijuana? I don't know if you get it already based on everything that I just mentioned previous to this, but you know, the experience of being able to culturally meet folks who, for me, um, I, I'm holding myself back from saying who are different. Cause at the end of the day, we're all human, but we're, you know, maybe birthed with a different language, birthed with a different uh, cultural outlook uh, and cultural lens. But at the same time, um, in Mexico, I met some of the warmest, most inviting, cool people. Even though if I didn't understand them 100% of the time, they were cool. They were just 
down to find someone who wasn't of their culture to be there um, to immerse themselves in it. It was just such a great experience. And plus the fact that you are so close to San Diego. So right here, um, this is Playas. Um, I understand there's been plans to demolish that bull ring. I don't know if that bull ring is still there or if they're demolishing it, but I understand if it's still there that they're going to be demolishing it. That bull ring is the largest seaside bull ring in the world. And I think it's the fourth largest bull ring in the world. Um, it holds, I think, 25,000 plus people. It was built in the 60s. And um, just that whole scene of Playas Tijuana is is so cool. And to have it be that close to the the border is uh, is just such a cool experience. Um, anyone uh, can can anyone translate uh, what we see there? It says a uh, unite for the sea or for the ocean. Yes, yes, exactly. And and that those are out, that that is that is outline of people. Um, it's a binational beach cleanup initiative. Um, I don't recall who, who led that initiative, but um, just a binational initiative to clean the ocean. And uh, you know, based on a telescopic photo lens like this, you can see just how close Tijuana actually is. Um, you got downtown San Diego, got the Coronado Bridge, and then you get into IB and then beyond that, is um is tijuana so when you look at it in a perspective like this it's uh it's just really close so if you can live there you gain a real unique perspective and understanding of the binational region because there's so many folks who victor mentioned 50 percent of san diegans have not visited tijuana but the majority of that percentage frankly live north of Chula Vista. Most people I know who are Chula Vista and South have family in Tijuana. They go there. And so you can really learn a lot more about the binational region when you either visit or live there. And um, it, it just makes more sense too when you watch the international nightly news and you find, you, you, you come across these stories and protests and things like that. It makes a lot more sense when you can actually be there and experience it for yourself. Um, another cool thing of, of living in Tijuana, living in Mexico, um, to give you that broader experience of binational cultures, of the language, really gives you an upper hand when it comes to, um, just frankly, business. There's so much business that comes out of Tijuana there in that, that area. I, I believe 90% of the imports, exports in and out of California all go through Tijuana. So to be there, um, there's so much industry and uh, manufacturing that happens there that um, it really gives you a unique understanding for uh, a lot of employers. And you know, if, if one was to hear all this and it sounds really cool, you heard my story and how I worked at Tijuana, how could you do it before actually living there? Tijuana walking tour is a great way if they're still doing their walking tours just considering everything with COVID that's a great way um, I think for 20 bucks or less you can go and do one of these walking tours they meet you at the border walk you around downtown it's all in English and it's a great way to have an initial encounter with downtown Tijuana um, maybe even cooler is Teresa Libre like I mentioned, uh, that I did that presentation with Derek. We talked about the um, the history of Tijuana 150 years ago. Derek has been leading Teresa Libre for over 10 years. Um, he's from Ohio, gringo like me, and he's been um, out there. Kind of like similar experience to mine. He also fell in love with it, and he just has been introducing many, many people to um, to the experience of Tijuana. And not only just these little walking tours, but he will take folks in a bus and take them to Tecate. Um, he'll take them to Valle de Guadalupe for wine tasting tours, um, tour Tijuana for craft beer tours, or go to Mercado Hidalgo 
and have that um, traditional market experience. Go to Secoot as well. One of the coolest experiences we had, my wife and I, we took uh, one of his tours. We went to Mexicali for Chinese New Year um, a number of years ago, which I think was in February. So that's coming up. And that was really cool. Um, Mexicali has the most Chinese out of anywhere else in Mexico. Um, if I recall the stat right during the tour, it was in the 1940s that there were, I think, maybe like 500 Mexicans living in Mexicali, but they had 10,000 Chinese um, to the point where they had two movie theaters in downtown Mexicali that exclusively showed only Chinese movies. So a really unique place. And they have this whole underground there and Teresa Lee Ray shows it all, um, including going to uh, the, the Ballenario. I forget what it's called in Tijuana, but the water park. They have this crazy cool water park in Tijuana. As you can see in the photo from the slip and slide that shoots you like 40 feet up. And that's really cool. Oh, and you can also go to Cholos games and uh, uh, Lucha Libre matches um, as well. Are and you familiar with... Are you familiar with uh, Jorge Maraz? He has a, a program on KPBS called Crossing South, and hmm. he's traveled to that. Yes. Even tried going down that slide, which I would not. <laughs> have you have you slide slid down the, the water park slide? So. <clears throat> <laughs> Um, it feels weird at this point to admit that I haven't just because for me, it was, um, local syndrome. I could always go. So I ended up never going. It's kind of like, like living in San Diego. It's like living in San Diego. Like I can go to Arizona and meet so many people who have been to SeaWorld in San Diego. And I lived in San Diego area for 14 years. I'd never been to SeaWorld just because I can always go. So I never did because it was always easy to just push off until another day. So that was just one of those things that I didn't. I found myself occupied with enough things in uh, the, the Centro area of Tijuana. I never La did it. Uh -huh. What's that? La Bufadora. I've been in La Bufadora. Yeah, yeah, right there, that, that bottom left-hand photo, the, the blowhole. A anyone uh, ever been, anyone else ever been to La Bufadora? Um, it's south of Ensenada. Cool, cool spot. Yeah, cool spot. And then just north of there, there's some cool camping that you can do. Um, there's some really cool camping on uh, on the Baja coast. Um, K58, kilometer 58, you can go and, and camp at uh, for anyone that's camping. Cañadas? What's that? Is it Las Cañadas? The camping place? Oh, Las Cañadas. No, I've heard of Las Cañadas. That's in Ensenada. I think that's even closer to like Valle de Guadalupe, which I've never been to Las Cañadas, but I think it's like a very family oriented camping area. There's like pools and stuff. Yeah. I mean, if you got kids and stuff, totally go check out, check out that place just based on everything that I've heard. Um, I've camped in Tecate. Where else have I camped down there? I've camped a bunch at like K58. That was always the easiest for my wife and for friends and I, cause from, from Tijuana, without crossing, we can just hop in a car and be at K58 in like 40 minutes, and that was great. So Cross the South has done all that. Oh, what's that? The Kenyatta, Crossing South with Jorge Maras. It's online on Facebook and on KPBS. You know, there, there's a great podcast on KPBS called Only Here. And this Kinsey is on one, about once a week, I think. Once or twice a week. Well, the, the, the podcast only here is um, Alan. What's his last name? Um, I had him on my bilingual podcast at one point. Uh, but Alan, Alan Lillenthal and Kinsey Morlane from KPBS, they do a great podcast called Only Here. And Kinsey Morlane, she used to be the editor for San Diego City Beat. So she covers a lot of cool stuff as far as like the art scene and other cool hipster stuff. Um, so that's a great podcast that KPBS does um, as well. But I don't know if currently, because th th this has been a presentation that I presented starting 
I mean, Victor can, can confirm this. I think it was about three years ago that I first began doing this. And at that time, these have been um, some active meetup groups. But um, And plus, obviously, considering COVID, don't know how active the meetup groups are. But um, just frankly, there's always people in San Diego who want to meet other people in San Diego who want to go and visit Tijuana. Because they know there's cool things in Tijuana, but... They're just probably, frankly, frustrated because many of their neighbors or coworkers are afraid to go to Tijuana because... Um, well, Google Jorge Miraz, and he includes uh, maps with directions. Gotcha. Okay, okay. Well, I, I won't do it since I'm, I'm here in Pennsylvania. I won't be back in Tijuana for a bit. But for you guys, totally. Anything that's going to help you guys get to know Tijuana better... Um, Google it. Yeah. Um, and emergent living Tijuana. So this is what I have been compelled to, to do, um, in my last year and a half of living in Tijuana. And this was great. Um, so even on YouTube, uh, there are still some videos that I have, have, a bilingual podcast as well, where we talk a bit about Tijuana and because it's bilingual for anyone who is working to learn Spanish, um, could be a helpful tool for learning Spanish as well and then when it comes to the safety of it that was always um the first question you know because frankly because of the u.s because of us and our love for illegal drugs for the prosperous economic opportunities that we've had for decades and decades um it brings unique challenges along the border but in particular in Tijuana, because there's the most deportees, because between California and Texas, you get the most immigrants because you're right there at the border. And because a lot of folks who do immigrate, they immigrate because um, they have family members who are already there. When I lived in Guadalajara, I met many people who asked me where I was from. I mentioned San Diego. I had so many people who were like, hey, do you know Santa Ana? It was like, yeah, it's like two hours north of me. And they were all like, oh, I have a, a tío and a tío and primo. Or like they knew someone who was in Santa Ana because that's where everyone would go. And because of this um, Latin American and international movement, it creates these unique challenges. So, of course, you'll see more military policing because of this. But in general, as American tourists... Most of the stuff that makes the international nightly news about violence and insecurity in Tijuana really does not have anything to do with American tourists who are going down there respectfully. And by respectfully, I mean commonsensically respectfully. It means you're not going down there and you're not cruising the red light district and being a drunken idiot and being disrespectful because you have money and you feel like you're an entitled American and all this and that. The moment that you go there with that, I, I don't have a feeling like anyone in this class is, is that way, even though I don't know any of you. You're all college students though, so you're, I'm assuming you're not likely in this demographic. But those who do make a lot of the stories that become this sense of, well, Tijuana's not safe to visit, this and this happens, the police are corrupt, um, it tends to do it tends to have to do with a lot of these things. So my encouragement is to stay clear of this. And the cool thing about Tijuana is that you can respectfully go and still really enjoy it without getting involved with a lot of these things that are a bit more high risk, especially if you don't know the language, you don't know the culture. And for me, my best times were hanging out with my roommates right here. This is us outside of Mamut which um, anyone who's a craft beer fan, Mamut is like the, the greatest spot in, uh, in Tijuana. And we'd go there and we'd hang out and it was, uh, it was always a cool time. Or again, like I mentioned, going to Sekou, um, I think this is us at the um, Tijuana Jazz Festival, which is just phenomenal. So um, just a really, really cool time. So um, if any of you guys have questions, Take a screenshot of this, hit me up, send me an email. Um, I'd be happy to chat. Um, 
I will do my best to get you up to date information, even though uh, my wife and I, we, we moved here to Pennsylvania over a year ago. Um, but you know, I still have friends in Tijuana and San Diego who update me. Um, my, uh, my coach, he's out of Tijuana. So I was talking with him yesterday and I was asking him how everything is. And he even told me, he's like, frankly, it's almost like COVID never even happened here. He's like, everything is open. People have masks, but everyone is still going out, doing everything like normal. Um, he does, he does say that as a result of that, that there is, um, high stats of sickness and death as a result, which is obviously really sad, but, uh, that's the update he told me. I knew I was going to be talking to you guys, so I asked him, and and that was the update that that he gave me. But um, you know, I'm happy to chat with you guys about any of this, and um, go visit Tijuana, go live in Tijuana. It's the coolest thing ever. Jim, thank you very much for your presentation. We still have a couple of minutes. It's already late. Let's take them a moment for probably two questions. I know that Jim is three hours from, from Tijuana. He's in this coast. So do you have any questions to our guests? It's not that late for me, Victor. I, I still get to go out and uh, get to go for a little walk after this. It's uh, it's good. Talking about Tijuana actually energizes me. Normally, I would be unconscious at this hour, but Tijuana is a very exciting topic for me. Yeah. When are you moving back? <laughs> Great question. And Victor was asking me about that tonight too. You know, as much as I loved Tijuana, um, I, I have a beautiful problem of being a polymath. I, I was telling Victor as we were catching up tonight, I'm actually working right now on writing a book about ambidexterity. Um, so I'm, I'm an MMD practitioner trainer, which is mere movement development. So that's that's my, that's going to be what I'm ultimately pursuing as much as before working on this book and recognizing that this feels more like my life calling. I actually thought I was going to be entering uh, international politics and uh, working to fight for uh, Latin American uh, immigrants rights. But uh, um, that might come after this as, as a polymath, we could do multiple things. So maybe it'll be uh, promoting uh, ambidexterity and, uh, uh i don't know being a senator later in the future but uh i don't know tijuana it's 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 always a draw but uh not at not at this moment ask me at the end of february when i'm sick and tired of snow and my answer might be a bit more definitive hey jim we're having um, snow next week here in san diego county really you can go visit it gosh go up to julie and get some apple pie and chuck some snowballs Sorry, I, I heard a, a, a male voice there. A, a question? Yeah, Jim. Um, I've written and published a couple of books, so if you ever need help with uh, publishing, um, let me know. Um, I might. Would you do me a favor? Just send me an email, please. Um, that'd be cool because I, I've never written a book before, and uh, I'm, my, my goal is to have my rough draft finished by the first day of spring. So. Perfect. Yeah. I'll send you an email. Well, quick, quick question. What have you written books on? So the first two books I actually wrote because I only spoke Spanish and I was trying to learn English. So I had a teacher encourage me to start writing. You have uh, no accents. That's crazy. Yeah. When did you learn English? <laughs> uh, survival here in the U.S. Nice. <laughs> Is your book yes. how to have zero accent and learn a foreign language? <laughs> no, no. Uh, the first two are like adventure stories. And then this third book that I wrote, um, because of writing books at a young age, I got invited to go speak at high schools all over the country. Killer. And um, I, I was more inclined to write a book on how these high school students could follow something they were passionate about. So the third book is called Change the World. You can see some of, uh, I've given a TED talk on, on that book and stuff like that. So you can kind of see some of the, the work that we're, we've been up to, but yeah, that, that, uh, process of, you know, the editing and publishing and everything like that and seeing the options of going with a publisher versus self-publishing and stuff like that is well, I've gone through that a couple of times. So, uh, which is kind of the, the bridge I'll be looking to, oh, what's your name? Miguel. Miguel, all right, cool. Pues entonces me vas a, a enviar un correo? 
Sí, ahí te lo mando. Por favor, okay, muchísimas gracias, Marvin. I think we have to finish our class. Sure. And I, I want to thank you, really, my friend Jim Holliston, for being our guest. He has so much to say on um, his cultural experience and immersed cultural experience in our city that I think we will need more time. But he's going to be my guest in my other class, and I'm going to give him more time for questions and answers. So I want to thank you again, Jim, for being awake at this hour in the East Coast. And well, see you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, Victor, Victor, one more thing. I hope you teach them about uh, Luis Donado uh, Colosio, because that was my most incredible honored experience I ever had was visiting his monument in Lomas Taurinas. Um, he, he was basically the JFK of Mexico. He was assassinated in 1994. And uh, um, it's nowhere that I will tell you guys go visit because it's just frankly still sketchy. But um, Victor has some very close relations to that. And in fact, there's a um, series on Netflix. And uh, I don't know if you guys realize, but YouTube and, and Google your, your professor because you'll find some really cool stuff. Vice Magazine did um, a feature about um, immigrants uh, from Latin America and Victor was featured all throughout that Vice documentary. So uh, he's a pretty bitchin' dude. And you guys are part of the coolest class in San Diego. So uh, um, go have an awesome time this semester. Go visit Tijuana when you can. And, you know, Victor, thank you for this as always. My pleasure. Thank you. Very interesting. Que tengan un buen tiempo. Nos veo la próxima semana en la clase. Okay, perfecto. Nos vemos ese entonces. Bye. Okay. Bye. Tomorrow. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Later.